What's up guys? I'm Sean and I'm an iOS developer here in San Francisco. I just recently left my first developer job and now I'm in the market for my second one. It's now the end of April in 2017 and I've made the rounds all over town, large companies, small companies. All in all, I've done about 15 to 20 interviews that made it to the phone screen or later stage. Real quick what those stages are. Typical technical interviews, if you're not familiar, you'll get a recruiter call, which is typically a 15 to 30 minute phone call just to get a feel for you and make sure you're not crazy. And the second step is a phone screen, which is a one hour call. We're going to do some live coding with someone. If you make it past that, then you go on to the big, long five to six hour all day onsite interview. So backing up, I've done about 15 to 20 interviews here around town that have made it to the phone screen stage or later. So I feel like I have a pretty good grasp on the type of iOS questions that are being asked at this time. So I decided to make a video series sharing this information with you guys. Now this first video is going to be an overview intro video. I'm going to talk about all the subjects, but I'm going to stay at a very high level. So if all you're looking for is a general idea of what's being asked and then a summary of an answer, this video is for you. However, if you want to deep dive in each one of these topics, I'm going to be putting out videos over the next couple weeks that will dive deeper into these topics. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned, subscribe, keep an eye out for more videos coming. All right, the first topic we're gonna to discuss is something that was asked in 100% of the interviews, so make sure you know this, and that is automatic reference counting, retain cycles, memory leaks, they're all kind of in the same genre. So the gist of automatic reference counting is it keeps track of your strong references to an object, and when that count gets to zero, it'll automatically deallocate it from memory for you. However, if you have a retain cycle where two objects have a strong reference to each other, it's, it's kind of a never-ending loop, and that count will never get to zero, and that's called a retain cycle or memory leak. And a general quick fix for this is to make one of those strong references a weak reference. And I'm sure you've seen this in code somewhere where it says weak, var, you know, whatever the name is. So that's what that's doing. That's preventing an extra strong reference from being made. So yeah, just a quick overview of automatic reference counting, retain cycles, memory leaks. Know this cold. Again, it was asked 100% of the time. I'll link to a great uh, Apple doc that explains automatic reference counting. Uh, it's pretty long, but if you read through that and you fully understand that, you'll be good to go. And one last tip, if you nail that basic retain cycle memory leak question, they're most likely gonna ask you the follow-up question, which is to explain memory leaks in closures. Uh, now that's where weak self and unknown self comes in. So make sure you research those as well. Now the next question that was asked, and I would say about 80% of the interviews, is communication patterns between views. And in Swift, what they're mainly talking about is delegates versus uh, observers and notifications. Now the main thing to know here is that delegates is a one-to-one -one communication, like one view is communicating with another view, whereas observers and notifications, you can uh, have one observer and then have 10 different areas notify that observer throughout your code. So it's a, it's a one-to-many communication pattern. So it's good to know when to use which communication pattern and the pros and cons of each. So for example, one of the downsides to the observer notification pattern, which again is the one to many pattern, is theoretically you could have 10 to 20 notifications spread out all throughout your code, all pointing back to one observer. So again, you can imagine in a complicated code base, uh, you know, there could be timing issues. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just hard to keep track of and it can get out of control. So just one example of the downsides, again, know the pros and cons of both and when to use each one, delegates versus notifications and observers. Next up, we have a pretty basic one, and that is what is the life cycle of a view? I got asked this about five or six times throughout all the interviews, so it's a pretty common question. It's good to know. So what we're talking about here is view did load, view will appear, view will lay out subviews, view did lay out subviews, and view did appear. That's creating the view. Now getting rid of the view is view will disappear, and then view did disappear. Let's run through each one of those real quick. Again, high level overview. View did load gets called the very first time the view is loaded into memory and it only gets called once. The reason I bring that up is because view will appear, which is the next step, gets called every time the view appears. Now an example of this is say you're in a navigation controller, a master detail view, and you keep going, you know, to the detail, back to the master, back and forth. Um, view did load is not gonna keep getting called, but view will appear will keep getting called. So if you have something you need to do every time the view appears, uh, such as an animation or anything like that, you need to do it in view will appear, not view to load, because view to load is only gonna get called once. So next is view will lay out subviews and view did lay out subviews. Now these two are where the view is actually laying out all the subviews, the constraints, the sizing and everything. And finally we have view did appear, which means the view is completely loaded. Now on the back side, we have view will disappear, which you can do stuff right before the view disappears. And then finally, view did disappear to let you know the view is gone. That's just a quick and dirty overview of the view lifecycle. Definitely research it some more. So the next question is something I got asked a couple times, and apparently I didn't learn from the first time I got asked it because I never had a good answer for it. And that is, what is your favorite Apple framework to work with? And what they're asking here is, you know, do you like core location? Do you like UI kit? Do you like map kit? And if you do, why? Give specific reasons why you like that API. Again, I never had a good answer for this question, so I can't really help you out that much, but figure out an API that you like to work with and have good reasons why. I got asked this next question a couple times, and it's a pretty basic one, and that's the classic, 
classes versus structs question. When would you use one versus the other? Explain that classes are a reference type that if you change a property on that class, you're actually gonna change the reference, whereas a struct is a value type, which essentially creates a copy of that object so you're not overwriting other properties. And then there's other issues that if you subclass something, you're inheriting everything from that parent class, which might be some bloat that you don't necessarily need, whereas structs are lightweight and clean. So make sure you know when to use a class versus when to use a struct and the pros and cons between the two. I only got asked about this next topic twice, so it's not super common, but it's still very useful to know. And that is filter, map, and reduce on collections in Swift. So filter, well, for example, filter an array. If you want to filter out all the even numbers in an array, you can do that. Uh, map is if you want to apply like a transform to every object in the array. So again, the, an array of numbers, if you want to multiply every number by three, you would use map. And then reduce, the classic example of reduce is summing up the numbers in an array. Now it's kind of hard to get much deeper than that in a talking example without actually showing you code. So I'll save that for when I do a separate video on filter, map, and reduce later in the series, but make sure you study up on this. So next up we have testing and it's a big one. Uh, I got asked pretty much every interview if I had experience with testing. And, Fortunately, I didn't, and I know for a fact it cost me one job and certainly didn't help with any of the others. So uh, if you're early in your career, you're junior, you've probably skimmed over testing to learn basically Swift in general, but it's absolutely something you should focus on. And that's actually what I'm doing right now in my downtime. I'm doing tutorials, trying to figure out how to build testing suites in some of my existing projects. Uh, don't overlook this, guys. It's an easy topic to skim over. Please don't. And the final non-coding topic I wanna to talk about is third-party libraries. Uh, I got asked pretty much all the time what experience I had with third-party libraries like CocoaPods or Carthage or Swift Package Manager. What they're looking for in this question is to see if you have experience using third-party libraries and if you understand the pros and cons to using them. At the end of the day, that's what a dependency is. You're depending on somebody else's code in your project. So especially in a language like Swift where it's constantly changing, you gotta hope the manager of that library is keeping up to date with Swift to keep your project going. I mean, that's just one example, but know the pros and cons of third-party libraries and know how to use them. All right, shifting gears a little bit, let's talk about some of the actual coding exercises I had to do. Now, obviously I can't say what company asked what question, and these are gonna be generalized principles, uh, so it's not the exact question I got asked, but this should give you some idea of what to expect. First up was the most common coding task I got asked to do, and that was gesture recognizers, which kind of caught me by surprise because they aren't something I typically use in projects. So what we're talking about here is the, the tap gesture recognizer, the pan gesture recognizer, or the pinch and zoom. Now in four different phone screens or on-site interviews, I got asked to do something with gesture recognizers. Uh, an example of this would be, you know, on the screen, grabbing a file and dragging it to a trash bin. Uh, just manipulating objects on the screen using a gesture recognizer. So don't sleep on this topic. There's tons of tutorials out there. Get some practice. From my experience, if you interview at a few companies, you're almost certainly gonna be asked to demonstrate your ability to use gesture recognizers in a UI. Next is something I surprisingly only got asked to do twice. I thought I was gonna get asked to do this at basically every interview, and that's networking. Um, an example of this was I had to authenticate on a server. They gave me all the API information, the endpoint I needed, uh, but essentially I had to build the URL with the proper headers uh, with authorization and make sure the body of the request uh, was complete with the username, password, et cetera, and I had to authenticate on the server and return uh, a token. Like I said, I was very surprised I only had to do this twice because this is a very fundamental task to iOS development. Uh, so definitely make sure you practice this, make sure you know it. I think I just got lucky I only had to do it twice. I imagine this is a very common question in interviews. Some other smaller and common questions I got asked was, I got asked to do merge sort in Swift. I also got asked to shuffle an array in Swift. Uh, and then debugging is also another big one. I got asked this about three or four times. Well, they'll actually put code in front of you and you have to debug it just by looking at it. I mean, you can't like run the project and let Xcode yell at you with all the errors. You have to find the errors yourself. And it's typically the usual suspects. Look for optionals being force unwrapped inappropriately. Uh, look for race conditions in the network calls, look for uh, retain cycles, memory leaks like we talked about earlier, uh, and then look for like UI not being updated on the main thread, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's usually kind of the same thing. So if you get a debugging question, look for those common issues. Another type of coding question I got asked more than once was to take a large unit and break it down into smaller units. So what I mean by that is, let's say you have 100,000 seconds and you need to break that down into days, hours, minutes, seconds. Now the key to these types of questions is the modulo operator. That's the percent sign. What modulo does is it gives you the remainder left. So just for example, two modulo five is going to be one. because two goes into five evenly twice, four, and then there's one remainder, so one. So again, two modulo five is one. Now how you would use this in this time example is let's say you had 64 seconds. So you would do 64 modulo 60, because there's 60 seconds in a minute, and that will give you a remainder of four. So you'd have one minute and four seconds. So that's kind of like the tail end of breaking it down into days, hours, minutes, seconds. You would just do that all the way down. 
So the moral of the story is, know the modulo operator, learn it, love it, do some practice problems. I got asked about it a few times. Uh, and just to kind of wrap up this coding problem section, just be really familiar with iterating through for loops and while loops, etc. Almost every problem has something to do with that. And finally, I just wanted to mention the take home project. Now I love these. So when you're doing the typical phone screen or on-site coding interview, you have somebody looking over your shoulder. You have typically a half hour to 45 minutes to do it. It's a lot of pressure and it's not how you typically work. However, the take home project, you know, you can sit at your desk for a couple hours, knock it out, do your typical researching that you do. Uh, I feel like I excel in those. So that being said, let me just talk real quick about a couple that I had to do. Uh, so one was basically a mini version of their app. I mean, it had everything from networking to building a table view to uh, building the UI to a design spec. I got handed a, a sketch file that had the design spec and, and I had to build exactly to that spec. Uh, persistence, it's an animation, and even MapKit. So it, it just touched on a lot of the core fundamentals that iOS developers have to use. Uh, I just really enjoyed the project. It took me about six hours to do, but I, I learned a lot. It was fun. Uh, so like I said, I, I love these take-home projects. Uh, another one I did that was not so easy and not so fun, but a good learning experience was I had to build a, a basic login flow, but it was a 100% programmatic UI. No storyboards, no nothing uh, for auto layout. I had to do auto layout completely in code. Uh, for me, it was the first time I had done that because I I've basically grown up on storyboards. So uh, that was challenging. And uh, I don't know if I'm a fan of it yet. I, I definitely saw how, how the other side lives a little bit. Now, a lot of people scoff at the idea of a take-home project, but I actually love them. Like I said, I feel like I excel at them. Uh, I look at it as a learning experience, whether I get the job or not. I, I built something. And it's a lot different when you're building something, knowing somebody's going to evaluate every line of code. You definitely take extra care to make sure everything is perfect about that code base. So that's good practice as well. All right. So there you have it. Like I said, I've done about 15 to 20 phone screens or on sites in the past two months. I've uh, been through the ringer in this whole interview process, so I'm kind of sharing my information. This is just the overview video. I'm going to be releasing new videos in the coming weeks that dives deep into each one of these topics, doing some of the coding examples, etc. So if you think you're going to find those useful, go and hit subscribe and keep an eye out in the coming weeks.